My mother was really sick, and uh, it was one of the toughest times of my life. And you and I, we can talk a little bit later about it. You know, we're working at some stuff together, and I, I shared it with you. And when you and I connected at, at Sundance, my mother freaked out. She's like, "Oh my God!" Like she, she knew who you were. And on your own, you recorded a song and sent it to me. And it was one of the last things my mother saw. And the smile from ear to ear that you gave to her and to my family in that moment is one of the most special things. In uh, yeah. And um, it was like the most defeated I've ever seen anyone in Hollywood look. It's like to this day, it's still one of my, my prized moments um, in this yeah, that's, career because you very rarely get to win, you know? That's and, an alpha move you did there, man. Yeah, yeah man. And he, so, he, he knocks on the door <laughs> and uh, he goes, okay, well, listen, I talked to the producers and they, they said, do whatever you want. Can you please come back downstairs now? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, let me just say, uh, you know, get ready and I'll be right back down. Cause you gotta put back on the same clothes, you know, that they had you in or whatever, you know? And so I turned to my wife and she was like, so what are you gonna do? And I was like, I have no idea. Me where I used to need alcohol to walk into that busy room so that I could feel like I, I was enough. For me, my purpose seems to be giving back and helping people. The more I give, the more I help people, the better I feel about me. It's really, really hard to feel like you are not enough when you've just helped the guy that was gonna commit suicide. It's really hard to feel like you're not as good as the other people in the room when you've been helping people. Welcome to the Apex Lifestyles Podcast. I'm your host, Bob GDMD, and I'm here as always with my co-host. Dennis V, what's going on today, Bob? Hey, you know what? Dennis, something big just happened today. Today's a really big day. This is really big. Yeah, you want you want to tell everybody about it? We yeah. crossed a big threshold today. Why don't you tell everybody? We did. We hit a hundred k subscribers on YouTube. Uh, we're really excited. We're going to be getting that uh, silver, the yeah, play button. Yeah, silver we're... silver play button. And I want to thank all the viewers, subscribers, for all of your support and everything you've done, and all the guests that have been coming on and really helping us reach our goals. And uh, a lot of great things coming. So thank you very much for all you've done. Yeah, with that, you know what? We had to dig deep and we found some more thunder to bring to the show, you know. And um, Dennis, you've known this uh, this person for, for, for a little bit now. And why don't you give him a good introduction? Uh, about eight years ago, I was at the Debbie Durkin's Equilux Lounge at Sundance Film Festival and uh, promote my brand at the time, a book that I put on Jagger's World of Autism. And one of the nicest gentleman i've ever met he and his wife came over to the table and uh we had a great conversation about the book about what he does and uh want to welcome from season one blake shelton's team jared blake what's going on man hey guys what's going on man thanks for having me yeah of course welcome welcome to the show it's a pleasure to have you on man i remember watching you back in 2011 it's uh it's pretty cool it's pretty surreal to see you on the screen right now that's awesome. That's awesome. The uh, the show definitely opened up a lot of a lot of avenues for me. I'm sure a lot of them we'll talk about today. So glad to be here. Yeah, glad, so happy to have you. You know, one of the things you know, I'm, I'm actually a um, a musician at heart. I, even though I'm a dentist full time, um, I went to music school first. I'm a guitar player, and uh, one of the things I noticed. So I live vicariously through a lot of musicians now. You know, that's kind of one of the things that I do. And um, one of the things I was noticing, uh, you know, about your style of music you definitely got some country going on there but there's rock in the background of that there's definitely some rock backbone you want to talk about that a little bit uh absolutely man i grew up on um um metallica acdc leonard skinner bob seger johnny cash those were the ones that i i related to the most uh johnny cash obviously his his lifestyle the way he grew up was a lot more like mine he grew up in arkansas as well as i in a rural town and so it was a more of a second nature in order to write that direction um style wise but uh the guitars and and everything uh just screamed out at me from from acdc and guns and roses those sort of things i mean the reality was even johnny cash started off in the, the rock genre so, um I just feel like there's a lot more soul there, but uh, as far as my, my actual writing style lyrically, uh, you know, I grew up in the country and you can't really hide that. So I've never really considered it country or rock. Um, you know, the world kind of makes you jump in these this genre, you know, and figure out and what you're going to yeah. call yourself. The, the reality is, and that's fading now with uh, with streaming and everything going on, you can kind of do whatever you want to and call it whatever you want to. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, take a, one of the things that our, our, our show is we, we talk about lifestyle. We talk about making your way up to the apex, like that uh, proverbial top of the mountain, right? So you kind of had um, the unique uh, instance that back in 2011, you know, you were on The Voice. And if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you, um, you had like a second chance at the uh, blind interview. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, and that, that's it's questionable because it's TV, so it's uh, it's hard to say what things are or what they aren't. I'll I'll tell you the the background of what actually happened there. They uh, they asked me to they asked everybody to to fill out the top to bottom um, from 150 songs, your favorite to your least favorite song. And then when I came in for the audition, they said we want you to sing your number one and your 150th. And uh, so I did that. <laughs> And then when we came to the filming, they were like, we want you to sing your 150th favorite song. Oh, and my like, God. Dude, like, you realize how bad you have to think a song sucks to, to rank it 150 out of That's 150? Terrible. Yeah, and uh, I was like, you guys sure? And they were like, yeah, yeah, they're going to eat it up. And I was like, all right. And so <laughs> I kind of put my own spin on it. And uh, they interviewed me right before, and they said, hey, what makes, what makes you pick this song? And I said, I didn't pick this song. And they were like, um, what do you mean? Well, tell us something you like about this song. And I was like, I don't like this song. There's, cause it's got like four words and two chords. It sucks. It's a horrible song. But that's what they had me sing. So I go out and I do it and they kick me off. And you're like, no chairs turn around or anything. Like, Are you freaking kidding me? You guys just made me come out and sing a song that I hated. And now you kick me off on national day. And they, they use that, you know, like Adam comes out and he's like, I don't really know why you picked that song. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere. It didn't really suit you. Blake Shelton says, you know, I, I thought, you know, I heard this voice and I was like, this is a country guy, but then he's singing this techno song and I was really confused. And you're like, right, of course. Adam. And so I'm, I'm pissed, honestly. Like I, I go back to my hotel room and, uh, I'm supposed to be going home and, uh, I've already got my flight and, uh, I'm packing up. And producer comes up, knocks on the door, and uh, he says, uh, hey, you know, they think that they made a mistake. They'd like you to come back down. And I said, well, I'm not coming. And I just shut the door. There you go. And there you um, go. he knocks again. Take away, I come out. Yeah, and he knocks again. And I come back, and, and he was like, well, can I ask you what would make you not want to come back down and get a second chance? And I said, I got this thing. I'm not real big on being kicked off of national TV twice in one day. And um, Fair enough, like, right? I, but I'm not interested, and I, I shut the door. Um, he leaves, he comes back, knocks on the door, same sort of thing. You know, I was like, not interested. I turned this guy down like three times. And on the third time I looked at my wife who's packing up as well. And, uh, I, I said, do you feel like that? Maybe I'm written into this script. Why do they keep coming back to the door? And yeah. she was like, I don't know. She was like, if I were you, I'd push it and see what happens. And so they come back and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll come back out under what a condition. I don't rehearse with the band. The band doesn't play with me. I come out acoustic and I pick the song this time. And they said, well, you don't, you don't get to call the shots on things. And I was like, well, then I don't play. And uh, he was like, uh, well, I guess it's not going to work out then. And he leaves. And he comes back again. And um, it was like the most defeated I've ever seen anyone in Hollywood look. It's like to this day, it's still one of my, my prized moments um, in this yeah, career because you very rarely get to win. You know, that's and, an alpha move you did there, man. Yeah, man. And, and he, he knocks on the door <laughs> and uh, he goes, okay, well, listen, I, I talked to the producers and they, they should do whatever you want. Can you please come back downstairs now? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, let me just say, uh, you know, get ready and I'll be right back down. Because you got to put back on the same clothes, you know, that they had you in or whatever, you know. And so I turned to my wife and she was like, so what are you going to do? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> So like, you didn't know what you didn't know what song you were gonna do. No, no. And so I sat down and thought about it, and I was like, I'm real. I'm a very emotional singer, and so I thought, you know, they're gonna be to see what's really going on with me. So I thought I should probably pick something that's passionate and angry, and uh, because I was angry at the time, and Emotions. so I picked uh, Dixie Chicks, um, "Not Ready to Make Nice." Yeah, and went back out there with just me and my acoustic guitar. And played it, and you know, the, the rest was history. Um, to my knowledge, I'm the only performer that ever got a chance to do that or anything like that. And they even told me after doing that song that for the first three season, that song was still one of their uh, top ranked downloaded songs for the first three seasons. 
Well, you um, nailed it that night. Off of that, but it was it was cool to know that. Yeah, but the song but was you nailed the performance. Right. You nailed the performance for sure. I yeah, appreciate it, it, brother. Jared. When you think about it, it's that was a defining moment in your life because the, the, first of all, the ball was in your court. You mm-hmm. know, you had a decision to make, and how do you think? How I mean, I know everything's hindsight, but how would things have changed? If you walked away from that opportunity, I mean, drastically, and yeah, nothing in my life would have moved at all. You know, you can't say where you'd be today. You don't know what other opportunities you would have gotten because reality TV does uh, limit you to a degree as well. As as good as it is, um, there are certain people that don't want to have anything to do with you because of that. Certain record industry, you know, companies, different things. Um, they feel like that you already had your moment, you know, and if it, it worked or didn't work, they either do or, or don't have anything to do with you. There's a, a little bit of pushback from radio. There's pushback from different people that don't support um, artists coming through that. Well, this the same way that we're getting pushback on uh, social media artists right now, kids that blew up on TikTok or, you know, Instagram or something. There's a lot of pushback on those kids as well. Uh, but, I mean, the the reality was is, I think it was the very next performance that they announced me as a recovering addict and father of six. And that was the moment that I wouldn't have gotten to have, uh, because those are things that you don't talk about as an artist. You don't talk about your uh, addiction past. You don't talk about jail time or rehabs. You don't talk about your six kids. It's just not, it's not quote unquote sexy. So that's not what you, push or promote and those that subject in particular has been what's defined my career and who i am as as a um a public figure or or even a human being at this point jared you know well documented you are really big into philanthropy and giving back and helping out in a lot of different areas first can you talk about what you do with the soldiers i mean you it's just unbelievable what you do and what you bring well i appreciate it um, and and all of our philanthropy at this point kind of bleeds in to uh the same space almost i'm, I'm not sure what it, exactly you're talking about with the soldiers because we do a lot with them uh, one of the things we do is we we travel over probably five times a year to active war zones and uh perform for them talk to them we go around the base just shake hands and get to know about their job, listen to what they're doing. And they typically FaceTime their families and we get on and talk to them. We bring around uh, cigars, challenge coins, patches. Uh, we typically give away a, a brand new Fender guitar on base while we're there to, to whatever soldier stood out the most to us for some reason. Um, and we perform. And uh, for a long time doing that, I didn't really realize what that was. You know, to me, I was just, you know, giving back and loving on people and playing songs. And I had a guy show up at one of our shows in Daytona, Florida. And um, he was uh, with the EOD uh, when we were in Jordan. And he had these flame tattoos going up his arm. He held his arms up at the concert, and I saw those flames. And I realized, like, that's the dude from the EOD in Jordan. And so I told security, like, hey, bring him backstage. And he gets backstage and we're talking and um, he was like, man, thank you guys so much for coming overseas for us. And and uh, he's like, I know you don't have to and you don't have to put yourself in dangerous way that way. And um, I was like, dude, you know, be kidding. Like, I was over there for five days. You guys are over there from anywhere from six months to a year. So it's the least that I can do. And he was like, but you don't understand. Like, he was like, I was in a position in my life in that moment that I had been kicking down doors and going whatever was behind it for six months and he said i was over there for nine months he said for six months it was just the worst hell that i'd ever been in and he said i had gotten within three months i stopped calling my wife i stopped talking to my kids i couldn't do anything that would make me emotional at all because i couldn't do my job i would just break and he said i couldn't think about life as i knew it before this moment in time and he said, you came over as a guy that I didn't know and brought, you know, a bar back home into the desert for me. And he said, and I had no emotional connection to you. So I could think about you 
without getting emotional. And he was like, so I would think about your performance over the next three months um, to remember that there is there was a life differently than what I was living that I could go back to. And um, to this day, when I tell that story, I get chills right now um, because it never occurred to me that it could be used that way. Uh, and what that was. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. And we've been, uh, in 18 war zones to date. Wow. Um, we, uh, we've been over there during, uh, uh, on Christmas twice, Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve. Uh, those are always my favorite ones because, uh, it's an emotional time for those guys. We also, in addition, like we're going out, um, tomorrow, we go to, um, tailgates and tall boys or tall, 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 tall boys and tailgates, something like that. It's a, a festival, a music festival. And, uh, we're going out there with a group called Creative Vets, uh, where we sit backstage with the, the other artists and, um, uh, write songs with veterans, uh, especially veterans that have PTSD or they're struggling with anything. Sometimes we write about what they saw in war. Sometimes we write about, you know, the things they missed at home. Other times we just write about drinking beer and playing music. Uh, just whatever it is that they feel like they need. So we do that, uh, as well as we tour VA hospitals, um, typically twice a year. The VA hospitals we go in, um, just walk from bed to bed, singing songs and, um, thanking people and telling our story and just loving on people. And what we find with it is, um, while that theory is very different than most of our um, charity work. So many of the times people just want to know that someone cares. You know, they don't need you to do anything for them. They don't need you to, to help them in any way necessarily. Uh, we had at one VA hospital in Kansas City, we went in and sang to uh, this 96-year-old man who was in the Korean War. And after we finished singing, he said, son, he was like, I have had... Um, Five children, 14 grandchildren. I've had uh, three heart bypasses. I've done this. I've done that. And he goes through his life of all these amazing things, good and bad, that he has experienced in his life. And he said, and today will go down as one of the best days of my life. And I said, how so? And he Hello. said, because today, two young men that didn't know me came in and thanked me for a war that America forgot ever happened. And that's unbelievable, just, Jared. You you, yeah. you, uh, you get addicted to those sort of moments, man. And so the philanthropy to, to me is uh, it's it's what I live for at this point. Um, and uh, specifically the, the veterans, uh, we do a lot of prison ministry as well as uh, schools, uh, talking to, to our youth about their lives and where they're going. Do you use music, it, which is we know music and the arts can be very therapeutic. And you're really using it as a great vehicle to support people that are going through past pre past and present issues and just giving them a good day, giving them a good moment, giving them something to grasp onto. And that is, that's just so incredible. Great work. Well, we, we use it in a multiple uh, of ways. Sometimes we use it just to open someone up and, um, and get them vulnerable so that they'll talk about what's going on in their life. Other times if it's, um, you know, for like the youth, it, it's mainly used as an entertainment value just to get them caught off guard, to get them away from the idea that some guy's going to come in and tell them what to do. Music often just, just opens up that creative flow and allows the brain to to take in the words that are going to be said. And I think there was a Harvard study that we read that said um, speeches that were done after someone had performed were like 90% uh, more effective, I believe. Uh, because they said there was something about the, the creative juices that are flowing helps the brain to retain the words that are about to be said. Several ways, like all the things that you forget in life, but you remember the words, the songs that you, you know, heard when you were 12. Yeah, it's amazing. That's like, um, music therapy, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, that, that's, um, it, it's really, really commendable what you're doing. And can you talk a little bit about, um, what you're doing with the kids in the schools? Yeah. So the kids is where everything started off for us. Um, when they announced me as a recovering addict on The Voice, we had, you know, in the music industry, most of your tour sponsors are all alcohol-based. Alcohol companies don't necessarily want to be lined up with a guy who was just announced as a recovering alcoholic or addict. So it closed off our options. Um, but what it did was uh, my, my Twitter feed went nuts. Most people don't know that uh, there's a little ball in the right-hand corner 
uh, of your Twitter feed. And that ball represents if you have uh, messages that have been unread. And when your Twitter feed fills up, that ball becomes a line and eventually becomes a, a, I think it was yellow back then. I'm not sure what color it is now. A yellow line that goes all the way down the side of your phone. We were being seen by 14 million people every night. So wow. my my bar stayed just one solid line on the side of the phone. And, and I could scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And you'd never find the end of it. And wow. um, most of it were was people that were looking for help uh, to get sober or uh, get clean or their their father or their mother, their son, their brother, their friend, just people looking for help. I started dedicating two hours every day to just sit there and answer questions. And you'd never remotely reach uh, the end of anything. It, uh, at some point, just got very, uh, I did that for probably two months. And at some point, it gets very depressing because you realize there's, there's so many problems out there and there's no real way to help all these people. You can give advice, but someone's got to really, really want to change and they've got to be willing to put in a lot of hard work if they're going to get clean. No. Yeah, and you can't unsee what you saw after that, you know? No, so like, no. And so, so like trying trying to, to wrap your head around all the problems there, like that must be heavy to, to, to kind of wrap your head around a little bit, right? Well, and to realize that you can't do anything about it. So we started thinking, well, if you can't fix the problem that's already there, maybe you can slow down the problem from, from being um, in, in our youth. And so we started thinking about uh, our youth and the type of programs that were in schools when we were in school. While I, I commend the DARE, D.A.R.E. program for um, trying, there was a lot of techniques about it that didn't work for me as a student. Um, there was a lot of fear tactics. There was a lot of, you know, this percentage of these people do this, and this is how it turns out, and these bad things happen. And, man, that just wasn't effective for me because the reality for me, when I started drinking and doing drugs, it was freaking awesome. It was the best time of my life. There was a reason that I kept doing it, and it wasn't because it wasn't awesome. I mean, that's the problem with drugs is they're so awesome that you'll give up your, your family for it. You'll give up your career. You'll give up your children. You'll give up anything and everything because they solve something in you that you've been trying to solve your entire life. The problem is that what they solve isn't real. It's only there while you're in the middle of your usage. And and what I find with most people is that it's this feeling that you don't belong or this feeling that you're not enough. And drugs and alcohol give you that confidence. It makes all those problems go away and all of a sudden you are enough. You know, for me, the, the big one was um, Jack Daniels and cocaine. Cocaine, if, if you've ever done it, it just makes you feel invincible. You just feel like you cannot be stopped. And um the courage that alcohol gives you and, and and that combination was uh was perfect for me. So we started thinking about okay, well, if the reason you turn to drugs is because you feel like you're not enough or you don't fit in, um and that's what helps you talk to people or feel like you fit in, then how would we help create that? And so we started looking at, well, I've been sober at that point. Uh I'd been sober for um uh, six, seven years, somewhere in there. And I started thinking, well, what is it that's kept me sober? And what had kept me sober was what I had built in my life. I had built a beautiful family. I had an amazing wife. Now here I was on TV and now I'm playing shows all around the, the world. And I desperately didn't want to lose that. I didn't want to lose all the things I had built. And so what was keeping me sober were all the things that I had created. And when I thought back to what kept me drunk or what kept me high was what I wasn't happy about my life. And so we started realizing, well, if you can get our youth or anyone to focus on what do you want your life to be like? How do you accomplish that? Well, who has that? Who has accomplished what you want? Who lives a life that you want to live? Who in your life do you look up to? Who inspires you? Uh, whether it's in your life or on TV, what is it about that person? And then track that down and mimic what they did to get the same success so that you can have that success. Then that takes your focus off of what you're not. 
because you're constantly achieving and you're proud of those achievements and you want to hold on to those achievements. You want to continue to grow. It just gives less downtime for you to explore alcohol and drugs or, or need it. So we started going into schools and talking to kids about, you know, what do you want your life to look like? Who has that? How did you, how did they get it? How do you get it? And really teaching people to uh, live with a purpose of uh, who you are and what you are, understanding that. And, and I found that, you know, for me, where I used to need alcohol to walk into that busy room so that I could feel like I, I was enough. For me, my purpose seems to be giving back and helping people. The more I give, the more I help people, the better I feel about me. It's really, really hard to feel like you are not enough when you've just helped a guy that was going to commit suicide. It's really hard to feel like you're not as good as the other people in the room when you've been helping people. If anything, I walk in that room these days, most of the time, and kind of feel sorry for everybody else in the room because I go, you might have a lot of money, you might have a lot of success, but you didn't just get to do what I got to do. You know, you didn't just feel someone's heart the way I got to. And uh, and I know how much I hold on to that and how much I, I enjoy that. Jer Jared, as you know, I've, I, you know, I've been a teacher for 30 years and I connect with kids all the time. And I think one of the beauties of what you're doing, kids are very curious. And a lot of times through books, through conversation, through music, and someone like you going in to talk about it, it gives them the platform to open up and to talk about things that they may not have talked about. And when you go in to speak to these children, maybe these are some things they're dealing with in their lives where they're dealing with addiction at their home and they're dealing with these issues. And maybe they have, I mean, they're at a pivotal time in their life where they're thinking about, do I start using drugs? Do I use alcohol? So you're making it different at an age where you can stop them before they even get there. Uh, what what does that feel like? What type of feedback do you get from the kids? Uh, well, you get great feedback during the the time, uh, but you never really know what that's going to turn into. So I'll give you a story of the you know every once in a while you know with working with kids that every once in a while you get that story and you know it's ten years in the making before you hear it and someone goes hey back a long time ago you said this and uh, one of them was we were in um, Jordan again and this kid walks up to me and I say kid you know he's in the military and you know halfway around the world in Jordan and uh, he's like six three and uh, towering over me. He walks up to me and says, uh, hey, do you remember me? And I was like, nah, sorry, man. I, I meet a lot of people. Uh, and uh, he goes, well, you came to my school one time. And uh, I was like, oh, hey, cool. And he said, uh, "He said, yeah. He was like, you called me out of the audience and made me stand on stage with you. And I was like, I do remember cool. you now. Very cool. And uh, I said, you guys, uh, you, were, you were talking shit down the front row. And he was like... <laughs> And he was like, uh, yeah, he was like, I, I was talking smack down there. And he said, and you called me out and asked me, had me come on stage. He said, because I didn't really remember it very well. He said, so I get on stage and he said, and then you didn't acknowledge my presence. You just continued to talk. You continued on with your speech. And then a little bit later, you looked over at me and you said, hey, so uh, what are you going to do with your life? And, um. I said, I, I don't you know. You put him right on the spot, yeah. right in front of everybody. And uh, he said, I don't know. And you said, uh, what grade are you in? And I said, I'm a senior. And you said, hey, you're working on that. And then you just went right back into speaking to everyone else. And you just left me standing there. And he was like, and then you looked back over at me and said, you can go sit down now. And he was like, and I went and sat down. And he was like, and I was pissed, dude. He was like, I was so mad at you. He was like, this jerk freaking called me out, made me look like crap. And he was like, and so I went home and I was like, screw that guy. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm going to show that guy what I'm made of. And he was like, and I literally carved out and found a career that day because I hated you. And I, I was, he said, I started looking up what I was interested in and what I was good at and what I could do. And I decided that day that I wanted to become an air traffic controlman. And I was like, so you're over here becoming an air traffic controlman? And he goes, nah, dog, I'm a freaking air traffic controlman. Um, so he graduated high school. You did your school. job, man. <laughs> he graduated high school. And, you know, four years later, here he is serving our country. 
you know, and defending our freedoms as an air traffic controlman uh, in the Air Force in Jordan. And, um, you know, every once in a while you get to hear one of those stories and you're like, wow, I wonder how many other people were affected that day. I wonder how many other people understood something. Because definitely when I started doing that, never did I think someone was going to, you know, call me up and be like, hey, you know, you changed my entire trajectory. You know, uh, but we do get kids send us messages every once in a while being like, hey, uh, I didn't even think about going to college until you spoke. And I just want to know that I just got accepted to West Point or uh, that was one of them. Um, kids uh, that, that come in that, that just start following you because of that and see the way that you live. And kids that will be like, hey, you know, I was really struggling. I was in a bad sexual relationship. And, uh, you know, I keep watching you and your family on social media and i just wanted you to know that um i recently started going to church and this and that and how many things changed in their life and so a lot of it is uh is not even what you said that day you just got their attention and they started following you and realized hey your life is pretty awesome maybe i'll do some of what he's doing jared when you took that moment that is you know you know as a parent there's things you say and do sometimes your kids look at you like why are they doing this it's an act of caring and you gave that young man an opportunity to think. And sometimes when you say something to your child or a student, you know that it may take time because we all process things differently. But obviously he processed it and went home. And you were giving every child, every veteran, every soldier overseas, you're giving them an opportunity to think, reflect on their lives. And uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. It is, that is just amazing work. And uh, you should be really proud of yourself. And, uh, what you've done, obstacles, and, and you know, I. What is an obstacle in, that you've overcome? Is you've because you're somebody that we in this show we talk about a lot about hitting your apex and uh, in life, and I look at you. You're somebody that has reached multiple apexes. What is uh, an obstacle that you've had to overcome as you reach your apex, and how did it help define you? Um, you, you, um, you obviously you have the, the big ones, uh, drugs and alcohol were, are a massive obstacle, but I feel like that the, the bigger side of that and where I feel like that my life is probably just now starting to, to, to go toward the peak of wherever I'm headed, um, is turning that. And, and I know in today's world, it's kind of almost feels weird to say this because you don't know who you're offending or, or whatever, but so if anybody out there is offended by what I'm about to say, I, I hope that you you understand this is just my life and this is uh, uh, what's working for me. the The reality for me was it was giving everything up and giving that all to God. It was realizing that I wasn't in charge of anything. It was realizing that uh, it wasn't about if I was playing music. It wasn't about if I was. Uh, you know, in, in schools or overseas, um, or if I was working construction with my wife, it, it really had nothing to do with uh, what I was actually doing. It had everything to do with how I was serving others. So for me, I grew up in a, um, a small uh, Baptist church, and I, I pulled away from that pretty hardcore at, at one point in time because what I saw was uh, a lot of people being very hypocritical um, the way that they handled things. And um, certain, you know, quote unquote sins that they like to point out a lot and then didn't want to look at the things that were wrong with them. And um, I had a lot of issues with it and um, pulled away from that and through going through AA uh, for years made me start to realize, like, I don't have a problem with this book. I have a problem with people. And um, it wasn't fair of me to hold an entire religion you know, hold something against that just because a lot of people failed. Because a lot of people fail everything, you know. If I were to look at anything in general and said, hey, well, I'm not going to be a part of anything where people fail, I wouldn't be a part of anything. There's crappy people in every walk of life and everything you do, you know. And so I started really diving into the teachings of Jesus at that point and um, thought, man, you can't really argue. You could argue if there's a God or not. You can't really argue the fact that this dude came to earth and every story that you've seen from him, he's just going, hey, go love people. Meet people where they are. Take care of people. You know, even like the part that gets me uh, is uh, 
Jesus is talking to the pharaohs, and the pharaohs are like, why do you hang out with all these dirty sinners, basically? And uh, uh, Jesus sarcastically says, well, I didn't, I didn't come here to save uh, the, um, how do you say it? I didn't come here to save the righteous. Uh, I came here to save sinners. And he basically was just telling the, you know, Pharisees and, and such and pharaohs and such at that point of like, oh, no, you know, you're, you're already holy. I don't need to talk to you. I'm going to go talk to these dirty people over here, you know? And, um, the, uh, I, I find that the humility, like I said, whether you believe or not, the humility that Jesus is portrayed in is something that all of us should be living like, uh, because he literally just loved. And so I think at that point, then it, my mind started going, hey, it doesn't really matter uh, to me in that moment, everything else the Bible says. It only mattered to me was, can I successfully walk through life loving people the way that Jesus did? And, you know, I'll probably worry about all the details once I figured out how to love everyone. Um, but I'm not totally there yet. I still pick and choose who I want to love. Um, but that was the true surrender to me was getting over what Jared wanted and, uh, and focusing on what God wanted. And, uh, I heard Bailey Zimmerman. I don't know who you guys know who that kid is, but he blew up on TikTok over a truck. And uh, once he had eyes on him, he was like, I don't know, maybe I'll try singing. And fast forward three short years later, he was, uh, on the CMA fest stage last night, the main stage, uh, two nights ago. Wow. I saw him. And, um, he got to the end of that, and the end of his show, and he said, hey, a lot of people ask, you know, how did I get here? And he was like, the reality is, is and I couldn't agree with him more. He said, the reality is, is that uh, I don't deserve any of this, and I didn't create any of this. God gave me this platform so that I could love others and tell everyone else how awesome my God is. And um, that's where I sit these days. And uh, I find that, that media on a whole wants to uh not talk about that for some reason but uh, i'm just not willing to shut my mouth about it anymore that's that's uh, what's helped me through everything and that's what that's the foundation that my family is built off of jared you know what's interesting is uh i know you remember this about a year and a half ago i was in a, a time in my life where i you know where my mother was really sick and uh, it was one of the toughest times of my life. And you and I, we, we can talk a little bit later about it, you know, we're working at some stuff together. And I, I shared it with you. And when you and I connected at, at Sundance, my mother freaked out. She's like, oh, my God, my God. She, she knew who you were. And on your own, you recorded a song and sent it to me. And it was one yeah. of the last things my mother saw. And the smile from ear to ear that you gave to her into my family in that moment is one of the most special things. And uh, so the way that you're living your life and doing things like that, that 100% as who you are as a person. And I personally want to thank you for that because it was, it just brought so much happiness to all of us. And I appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for saying that because, uh, you know, those are the things that, that help me to separate uh, from the world or disconnect from the world when you hear those sort of things. Uh, because it, it's so easy to compare yourself with everyone else and compare your success or, you know, you know how it is. I mean, how many people liked your post today or how many, how much your, your song is streaming. And, um, uh, that's been a big deal to be able to separate and go, Hey, not every song and not everything you do was meant to have worldly success. Sometimes it was just meant for one person. You know, that's so true, man. Like that is a, a really good way to kind of, um, put that into perspective you know like you and you and i just shared something you know dennis and i just shared something he shared something with me yesterday that um you know we really can't talk about on 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 air here but uh, yeah you know you never know who you're actually touching and i think that that's a pretty amazing uh way for you to use your your talents and uh and do that I, I, and, and i can feel it right through the, the the screen here it's pretty amazing i want to shift gears a little bit if you wouldn't mind i want to talk about um you know, you're at the blind audition and you see. I knew, wait a second. I, I, did I it. knew he was going this year. When, right. when we talk about an energy shift, I, I was wondering when this moment would come. I didn't want, but Bob, back to you. I, you, hey, you I'm just can't even hold this. 
He has that smile ear to ear. Bob, sorry. Go, go for it, buddy. You're good. You're good. You're good. He, you know, it, Dennis and I have been working together for a little while now, so he, he kind of can uh, feel when it's coming. God. So, all right, here we are. We're going to set the stage. You're on the stage. You see the backs of all the judges, right? And yeah. and I'm assuming, I mean, I, I can assume you probably wanted, you know, any one of them to turn around at that moment, right? Right. Um, Adam Levine might have been a cool one for you, I guess. But, you know, I'm guessing you wanted, you know, Blake to turn around, right? Yeah. Right? So that, and I think he was one of the last ones to turn around, right? Uh, he was, he was the only one for me. I think, I think, I think, um, I think I remember, I actually just watched it again, right? I think you did have uh, everybody except, I, I think you had two others, actually. Hot man. Yeah, I think you did. That's and then, funny. Then my my memory was uh was was him. So that that shows you where my focus. Well, you were you were locked in then, right? So so you're playing right, and then you see him come. You, you see him turn around, right? And and you actually pointed at him. Uh, what was going through your mind in that moment, right there? Hmm. I mean, there, there was a a lot of things. I, I think and this may sound vain, even, but I, I think it was validation. Uh, yeah. I think it was. You were on a platform where you knew millions of people were watching and, and uh, someone said you, you know, and you knew that you had just gotten on this show. And I think that that's part of why it's been cool going to these schools and such is because no matter what you accomplish after that, no one can ever take that from you because it, it's so public. It's so in your face. And while we all are in an industry where you're around entertainers and stuff. Most of the world never, ever gets to do anything remotely like that. Yeah. And so no matter what, it still gives you a story and a power in what you're saying to people uh, that, that make people listen. And yeah, all of just that a legitimacy, kind of flooded, right? Yeah. All of that just kind of flooded through in that moment where you knew like my life has been changed forever in that moment. Uh, Cause the only thing that could destroy that is you. As long as you use that platform to the best of your ability, you you just created something, you know, that you know, years later is still feeding my family, you know? Yeah, I mean, at that moment, did you really, did you have that, that notion that my life just changed in that moment? Yeah, for sure. Did, did that happen to you? Like, did that like, yeah. kind of, yeah, I can imagine that. I can only imagine that, really. Um, yeah. I have not experienced that myself. I mean, I that was, of- uh, I mean, I remember talking to my daughter right after that, and uh, she was uh, asking about if I was afraid of you know how far i was going to go and i was like not really it was like she was like yeah but you don't have to go back to your concrete job and i was like i'm pretty sure the only way i'm going to go back to a regular job is if i choose to at this point you know it's uh it's it's within your control now you know and not like that road has been easy by any means afterwards but um it definitely was a life-changing moment and i and i definitely felt it yeah, it's so cool, man. And uh, you know, it's uh it's kind of surreal talking to you here. I, I watched you on uh I watched you live when it happened. I was a big fan when it then that first came out and I was uh I was locked in. So I remember it. I mean it was a while ago, but I remember it. And um I remember being a fan then, so it's really cool to see it at this time. And I'm I'm happy, Dennis, that you made the introduction and uh you know, uh Jared, like this has been a great interview, man. I I, I applaud you for everything you're doing. I mean, you're a philanthropist all through and through and um this, the work that you're doing with the troops is just, just unbelievable. It's amazing. Well, I, I appreciate it, brother. And uh, I, I assume, Dennis, we're going to at least give some sort of plug about some of the stuff that we're doing together, aren't we? That was my next question. Let's go. What do you got? Well, Let's talk um, about it. So we, right now, Dennis and I, and this is all on me. Dennis has been ready for a long time. Uh, it's just my <laughs> schedule and getting everything um, ready because uh, mostly – uh, our project hasn't been put out yet because I wanted to make sure that I was dedicating the time to it that I needed to, to promote it correctly. Um, so Dennis and I discussed uh, years ago about uh, putting a book out. And if I remember correctly, you would come to me and said, hey, I had had this idea about writing a, a children's book about a singer that goes into schools or goes and talks to children. And um, I was like, I do that. You know, one thing led to another. We were like, wow, so... This vision that I had of writing this book, you are the life, real life version of that. And that, uh, that was a pretty amazing spot to be. So I think that we both knew something would eventually happen. And once again, you know, uh, it could be God's timing or, or, or just, you know, the right timing. I don't know. It's been years in the making, but, uh, we do have, uh, physical copies of these books now. 
Uh, we're in the studio putting a song with that as well. Um, and uh, we're we're trying to decide when that's going to be released. Me and my wife were just talking about the other day of possibly uh, the time frame of launching that and uh, just jumping in the sprinter and and uh, going down the coast of Florida and back up the, the East Coast and, and just doing a uh, book tour to launch it. Uh, it's you could ask any of my friends i'm probably more i've probably talked about that book more than anything else i'm more excited about it because i i know what it can and can do and i know that part of what's taking so long is i believe that this is going to be a um a, uh, a series a book series and so i just wanted to get launched as as good as possible uh first go round but Dennis essentially wrote the book based off of the uh, the stories that um, we discussed about my life and some of the people in my life. Um, so all the characters in the book are based off of real life people uh, as well. Uh, with that thought of like, hey, if the, the book series is doing well, then we can start involving all of these real life people in book readings and and such as that. And the uh, the the first story is about choices. And uh, I felt like that, and Dennis felt like that that was a good way to start it off because that's essentially what our, our program in schools are about is choices. And the hope is, is that we bring in a lot of, you know, normal everyday topics, but then uh, some of the books start going into a little deeper topic that uh, maybe those books are targeted at school therapists and different things to, uh, to help kids uh, to identify what issues are going on in some of those kids' lives. Uh, to see, you know, whether it be uh, abuse of any kind at, at home or ADD, ADHD, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, very excited about this book line, and Dennis will probably speak a little more professional about it because, uh, you know, that's his job. So, Jared, I couldn't do better than you, uh, you know, you, to put together what you're doing and how you go out there. And, you know, it's basically what you talked about today, the connections that you're making with individuals you're giving them an opportunity to think and think about the choices they make before they make them. And uh, I, I just think about what you do at the elementary, middle, high school level and what you're doing in life. You're letting everybody know that they have an opportunity to make a choice. I don't think there's a better age or platform that you can hit than the youth because those minds, they have a lot of things going at them at a young age. They're thinking, they have a lot of people telling them different things and peers and what to do. And I know there's many elements like that in it. And, uh, you know, you're a great storyteller as well. So it, it came, it came together and, uh, it, it's, it's going to be great. So looking forward to the launch of that, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you just hit a point that I, I think may change my opening line, uh, when I go to the schools is, uh, you said I'm giving them an opportunity to think. And we in America, for some reason or another, have forgotten and completely take for granted the fact that you were born here. <laughs> you were born in a nation where you have the opportunity to think. You have the opportunity to decide where you're going to go. Virtually in any position in life, no matter how crappy of a place you were born into, you still have a choice of where you're going to go in life. You, you can follow along your parents' footsteps, good or bad. Or you cannot. It's it's pretty incredible that when we go to these other nations, I do a lot of work as well with uh, uh, the youth and military in other nations, and um, most of the United States has never been out of the United States. And if they have, they were on vacation, and they went to some cushy little resort somewhere and have no thought that these people don't have a choice. Almost every other nation out there. And we talk about, uh, you know, well, there's so many other free nations. There are, but there's still a rarity as well. And and even those free nations, uh, if you really get to explore it, they don't quite have the same freedoms that you have. You know, I mean, we've got in our nation right now, everyone arguing over politics. And uh, we all take for granted that you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to say whatever you want to about the president of the United States, no matter who it is. You can openly trash whoever your leader is. That's some pretty crazy freedom. And that doesn't happen in most places, you know? And uh, it's, it's just, it's incredible to me that uh, 
that we don't see that. And so I think that that's so valid what you said of, you know, you're giving the opportunity to think. I mean, wow. I mean, isn't that something that we all take for granted? Just the fact that you have an opportunity to think freely and change your position in life. Jared, you know, Bob likes to go down rabbit holes quite a bit. And I think he's going to laugh at this one. There's a, one of my favorite movies of all time is Inherit the Wind about the Scope Monkey Trials. And one of the lines, and I, I can't even think of the name of the actor that says he was a lawyer. And he says, you are trying to take away the ability to let people think. And that's something that we have in America where we can think. And uh, you're doing that when you go into schools and every platform that you use. So keep doing it, brother. You're doing great work, man. Well, what can I say after all of that? That's uh, amazing. When when is this? Uh, when when do you launch your book? Well, Dennis and I have to uh, discuss that. Uh, if you ask me, I'm always thinking. You know, well, hopefully in a couple months. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> seriously, I, I I am hoping for um, the uh, the beginning of the school year would be the uh, the the target. Everything's ready to go. I just have to put together between uh, myself, my wife, and, and Dennis just have to put together the, the school tour as well as the um, the uh, book tour, a bookstore tour, and uh, get our sponsors on board. So that's uh, one thing that we could discuss real quick. We are looking, we'll be starting a campaign for sponsorship soon uh, because we want to get as many of these books uh, to children for free in school as possible. Uh, I love being a, to go to a school and have a product that you can buy, but I would love much more than that to have businesses pick up that tab um, so that we can bless children that, that aren't as fortunate to uh, get a hold of these books, to uh, to see that different choices can be made in their life and they, they don't necessarily have to stay where they were born into. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I love that, actually. That's a great idea. So, you know, where can people reach out and um, and follow you? Uh, everything's Jared Blake music. The the running joke at my house is that I'm like a five year old. I can't remember anything. I barely know what's going on, and so uh, they made things as simple as possible for me. So every social media, every sort of platform is all Jared Blake music. J A R E D B L A K E music, and uh, you can reach me there. Um, I'm not real big uh, of a fan necessarily of social media sometimes because I, I get concerned with the mental health that is attached with it. But uh, I do check my messages, um, and I uh, probably only check the messages probably about once a week. But if you've sent me a message, I'll definitely respond back to you. Nice. And now, uh, what's the uh, future hold for Jarek Blake music? Uh, right now, musically, the uh, the next couple things are uh, the song that we're putting out with the book, um, as well as we are doing a song that we wrote uh, a couple years back, Daryl Worley cut it and put it out, and um, radio kind of rejected it uh, because it was uh, about the suicide rate amongst uh, veterans. And uh, that's a big, pretty big and hard subject for radio to to want to get behind and promote. It tested well, but uh, they just wouldn't spin it. And so uh, Randy Couture and Eric Landis are the two guys that I wrote it with. You guys know who Randy Couture is? A six-time UFC champion. Sure he was a, a good buddy of mine, and uh, we wrote this song together about the fact that 22 soldiers commit suicide in the United States every day. And this particular song, uh, for me, was written uh, about the perspective of Joey Jones, the guy that ran Boot Campaign. He's now a, uh, a public speaker. Uh, he uh, came back from the war with no legs and um, thought about suicide and then decided that there wasn't going to be... Um, Essentially, there wasn't going to be 22 people that died that day that he was uh, going to make a different choice. And so the song is uh, more of a, um, a hopeful song that you don't have to help create that number. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, having Randy and some of his Hollywood friends produce that and star in it and uh, see if we can't make, uh, since radio doesn't want to back that song because of its subject matter, see if we can't make a stink on social media with it. There you go. That's uh, that's a beauty of social media. That's the the positive side of it, right? Is right. that you can reach a lot of people real quick. So um, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, incredible guest. I gotta say, I'm I'm, I'm a fan of your your uh, of your of your art, and I'm a fan of you. I mean, you you just uh, you're an inspiration, man. And uh, I wish more people would be like you and and think about other people while they're uh, out there trying to you know. Uh, spread the word of their mission, you know, and I, I think it's exemplary what you're doing. And uh, thanks for coming on today. Dude, absolutely. Thanks for having me and, and thanks for all the.
Um, so uh, glad to be here anytime. Jared, blessed to have you. Uh, incredible, incredible, incredible interview. And uh, the world people, uh, excuse me, the world is born Jared Blake. Well, that needs more than do. <laughs> yeah, without it. I uh, appreciate that, Jared. Thank you, man. Yeah, well, without a doubt, Dennis, I think, uh, you know, let's uh, let's take it home and, uh, you know. It's go time.